This is a University of Otago podcast. I think it's widely accepted that we have got an epidemic of obesity. Whose responsibility is New Zealand's waistline? It's a very interesting way of asking a question. People do know what to eat in the main, and they do know that they should be physically active. The difficulty is making those behaviour changes. We don't need to smoke, we don't need drugs, we don't need alcohol, but we need to eat three times a day. And that is what makes this whole issue so, so extremely complex. Obesity is probably one of the most important causes of ill health worldwide. I think obesity is a problem for two reasons. One, it is extremely common in New Zealand and most other countries worldwide. And secondly, the consequences of obesity are absolutely horrific. Perhaps diabetes is the most important of all, but I think people forget that even cancers are strongly associated with obesity. I think the most important point to make is a negative one to start off with, and that is there's no way that this can be due to genes. Genes can't explain why obesity has become an epidemic over a relatively short period of time. So it must be either to do with lack of physical activity or inappropriate eating. It has been said that we live in a toxic environment, which is not only because the air is polluted or the water is bad, we are walking around uh, where there are ads, there are signals, there are smells, there are signs, all the time telling us what to eat. The treatment of obesity is extremely difficult. The drugs that we have are totally ineffective, and in fact there is not a single really useful drug available. I was at the hospital one day, the doctor told me, you know you're 140 kilos. And every classification I was wrong, my cholesterol was wrong, my diabetes was wrong, everything that you get tested for, for the vitals of life, weren't happy. Like, my doctor despaired. People do know what to eat in the main, and they do know that they should be physically active. The difficulty is making those behaviour changes because of how we live. I used to be a, a, a great pie man and a sausage man. Roasts loved them. I, cu I basically cut them out. And I, I was, every time I saw a sausage, I, I'd just about freak out because I thought, no, don't get it, don't get it. When you decide that you want to lose weight or you put behaviours in place to make that actually happen, you know, you're talking about a major life change for many people. You've got to change your, your whole life, if you like, rather than just diet or change a few foods or things like that. I've been swimming for about 30 years. That exercise wasn't enough. So I thought, well, I've got to do something more. So I doubled my swimming times. That helped a wee bit. And then I thought, well, I'm going to really have to try something else. So I brought a bike. And in 12 months, I did 12,000 kilometres. It is a hard job to get rid of weight, taking me about six years to lose my 30 kilos. But it's been a good six years when you look back. Treating people who are appreciably obese or even overweight is not an easy task. It requires a substantial commitment on the part of people who want to lose weight. And the real hope of dealing with the epidemic of obesity lies in prevention. We do know that prevention works. There's been a lot of studies in different countries show that prevention can work. It can work in schools, it can work in communities, it can work in workplaces. Environmental change is an absolutely critical component in terms of preventing obesity. I think it is up to a whole range of actor groups who are responsible for making policy, be it policy at a national level or local level, to create the appropriate environment. One example of an actor group is the group of people who employ other people. And if you employ people, you can play a very important role in providing an environment 
which is conducive to appropriate choices. Some employers provide gyms. Employers can provide appropriate foods in their canteens. So there are a substantial number of things that employers can do. Perhaps the most important environmental change is provided by governments who can uh, provide regulations or make laws to ensure appropriate environments. The government legislates in all sorts of areas. You, they legislate on smoking, they legislate on seatbelt use, they legislate on all sorts of things. Yeah, look, we legislate for a number of things uh, and people are still going to break the law. We, we legislate for tobacco displays and the age of purchase of, of tobacco. We have big road safety plans, but people are still going to speed and not use their seatbelts. There doesn't seem to be anything that we can do to encourage this government. Uh, we did manage with the Labour government to persuade them to set up a nutrition fund for schools, to introduce healthy school food guidelines, and to spend quite a lot of money on education programs targeted at children to encourage healthy eating. The previous government introduced a mechanism by which it became inappropriate, unacceptable, to provide an excessive amount of energy-dense foods to children at schools. The current government believes that telling children uh, what they should eat at school is a nanny state philosophy and has removed this regulation. This isn't a government that's too worried about points of principle or uh, poster campaigns or internet campaigns. What we really want is to invest in things that work. Banning pies from tuck shops at school wasn't working. The kids just took off across the road and went to the local dairy. We do live in a free society where people are free to make choices for themselves, even when those choices are bad choices. Now, there is pretty much worldwide acceptance amongst people that are regarded as authorities in this field that creating a healthy environment at school, which includes a healthy eating environment, is an essential component. I see it every day when people tell me, there are no fat kids in your school. You know, they're all skinny. Um, if you'd been here six years ago, we would have looked like most New Zealand schools where there was a wide range of sizes. Schools make the decision as to whether there should be dispensing machines uh, from which children can buy uh, energy-dense fast foods. Um, we don't have a school tuck shop because the kitchen produces all the food, so there's no chance you'll be able to stop in and get a pie or a, a V or a packet of lollies. And in fact, there's very little chance you'll get them from our local dairies around here too because the children have been active in going into our dairies and asking them not to sell those types of foods to our community. Uh, schools can decide whether to have uh, gardens where children can learn how to grow uh, healthy fruit and vegetables and learn how delicious they are uh, when they're eaten fresh. Throughout the school we've got this kaupapa or this philosophy where we will grow our healthy kai, we will prepare it in the traditional ways that we can and then we will share it with each other. There are studies showing that if you teach children early in life to enjoy a variety of foods, they are more likely later on to make those healthy choices because you can't enjoy a food you've never seen before in your life. I'm always encouraged by our five-year-olds who are new to the school and how quickly they pick up on that kaupapa of growing something, watching it, looking after it, watering it, nurturing it, feeding it, and then the delight on their faces when they get to eat it. The reason that a lot of fast food companies will not make uh, moves in this area is that quite often it reduces the taste because we all like fat, sugar and salt um, in our food. And secondly, and sometimes the toughest thing to get your head around, is that it also costs more. I don't think that there is any doubt that uh, one needs to think very seriously about what happens in fast food outlets because a large proportion of the population are regular consumers of their food. We've changed the oil that we cook in, uh, which has taken out 730,000 kilos of saturated fat. We've halved the sugar uh, in our buns. I would have to say that from what I have heard about the attempts being made by McDonald's, that they are making some real attempts uh, to provide alternative options. 
McDonald's launched our Weight Watchers partnership in the start of 2010. And for me, I think that was groundbreaking stuff, that we partnered with an outside party and created some meals that were endorsed or evaluated on the same criteria as every other food was created in New Zealand. What I think is interesting about that whole area is where is where are those foods targeted? I don't think those foods are targeted to people who currently eat burgers. I think they're trying to actually get a new market in, so they're trying to actually get in the, the girlfriend or the mother perhaps who will go to McDonald's and have a salad and everyone else at the table will have the other food. So while I applaud them for introducing those menu options, in my mind they're not introducing them to replace the other foods because that doesn't make good business sense, let's face it. They're actually just trying to increase their total market. I don't think it's really plausible that fast food will go away. I just don't think consumers' behaviour and the way society is moving towards that we will eliminate fast food. So we have to find a way to work together to influence behaviour within the category. Temptation is one of the hardest things in the world to get away from. Trust me, it is hard. There's no doubt that advertising work and our best level of evidence for that is that they do it. We made the decision to only advertise a lot of choice as part of the Happy Meal, which is the sea chicken snack wrap, the apple slices and the drink. And what we found is that now 50% of those meals, um, the child is taking up one of those options. There is evidence from Canada that if children are not exposed to these adverts where they are encouraged to ask their parents or to select for themselves um, inappropriate energy dense foods, that they uh, do not do so. We do have the ability to influence people. We do have the ability to influence uh, children. We actually found that was quite a positive thing. One of the most important things that government can do is to not only discourage but to prevent food advertisements which encourage children to make inappropriate food choices to be screened at times when children are likely to be watching television. So is there a place for healthy fast food uh, in New Zealand? Well it depends on what you define as healthy. I think there is room for fast food that is healthier than what it is today. Oh, I think believe the doctors in that when they tell you being overweight ain't good. Like I know there's a lot of people around that are overweight that have no problems, but the majority have problems. And if you've got as many as I got, you wish you never had. We still need to take a long, hard look at ourselves as a country, look at what we're doing to our children, and look at what we're doing to our families, and think about the holistic, the bigger picture on how we can support each other. So the media, health-related organisations, schools, employers and the food industry all have a role to play, along with government, in changing the obesogenic environment. We have to fix this problem because society will not be able to cope with the consequences of leaving the situation as it is.